If you require traditionally structured plot-driven narratives, this isn't for you. But if you enjoy experimental literary fragments and philosophical musings on exile as well as a healthy dose of feminism, then stay tuned. Hey readers, Echo here. I have a quick uh, book recommendation for you guys today. Christina Perirossi uh, is an Uruguayan novelist, journalist, and poet uh, who is associated with the Latin American boom. And she did keep writing through the, through the post boom and beyond. Uh, Christina uh, is a feminist and she wasn't openly homosexual. Uh, which meant when the civic military dictatorship was established in Uruguay, she had to move to Barcelona and has uh, ever since been in exile and very concerned with identity in exile. Um, Cristina won the Miguel de Cervantes Prize in 2021, which is one of the most prestigious literary prizes in the world. Uh, it's only been awarded since 1975. And there's only been six women to receive the prize. I've read a couple of books on the Latin American postmodernism and women writers now, and Perry Rossi has been written about in, in both of them. As you can see, the book I want to talk today about today is The Ship of Fools. Uh, the book uses the allegory of The Ship of Fools by Plato, as well as... Uh, Little interchapter descriptions of uh, different parts of the tapestry of creation, through to guide uh, the thinking and mm, impose some sort of structure or order to the text, um, because the text is fragmentary and little vignettes of uh, of travel writing. Um, that's the, the main character, Equis, or X, who is literally an X, and an everyman, a, a vaguely defined unnamed protagonist, uh, whose most important characteristic is that he is in exile. Uh, the book has many short uh, chapters uh, describing his travels uh, or his cities where he has lived. And as the perpetual foreigner, this is used to contrast and show uh, what is strange about the cities and societies we live in. He he meets many interesting characters who are the real stars of the book. Um, I want to read a little bit from the very beginning here. It starts with a little quote from Exodus. A stranger, X, estranged. Expelled from the womb of earth, eviscerated, once more to give birth. Thou shalt not oppress a stranger. Yes, you. 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 You who are not. You know. You all know. We're beginning to know how it beats. How. The heart of a stranger, the outsider. Looking in, the intruder, the fugitive, the vagabond, the lost one. Who would know him? Who would know, perchance, how fares the soul of the stranger? Sad, resentful, has he a soul at all? Seeing ye were strangers in the land of Egypt. The ship's siren had begun to howl exactly at line 18 of the Iliad, Canto 6. Great-hearted son of Titus, why ask you of my lineage? Thus Glaucus confronting Diomedes, Sirens, legendary maidens living on an isle between Circe's domain and the reef of Scylla. Who, with their enchanting voices, lured the sailors? He remarked this because it was the fifth day of the journey and the second port of call. The beautiful passenger approached him. For want of anything better to say, her voice purring like that of a white cat bored with the sea, she inquired, What are you reading? He informed her, noting carefully that there were many different versions. 
In others, for example, Glaucus says, why do you question me about my past? And the sirens, they weren't the same either. Salvatore Quasimodo had begun a new translation of the Iliad. He hadn't finished the task, but there were four beautiful cantos. Where? Ah yes, in the hold of the ship, boxed up many hundreds of miles to sea in some direction, east or west, north or south. He had never been well versed in geography or in oceans. Um, he meets lots of interesting characters. There's a character who was uh, the first man to walk on the moon uh, that now spends his days drinking and telling his tale to anyone who will listen. X is a, a great listener because he's also in exile. Uh, the fact that this man could never return to the moon and that the, achieve, the excitement around his achievement has faded, that nobody has any understanding of what he has seen and what was taken from him. It doesn't quite reach magical realism, uh, but there is a vague shapelessness adds to the feeling of something like fabulism. There is a journey to a land of literal navel gazers. There is a funny encounter with an overweight Scandinavian woman um, where an incredibly unlikely sed seduction takes place despite an impenetrable language barrier and the, the play of this language barrier is to me very funny. It is probable that she did not understand what he said, nor did she inform him of her name, age, religion, political affiliations, country of origin, etc. But these declarations, which might interest an immigration officer, did not interest X. He was convinced that she was Swedish, five times her grandmother, that she had been widowed for several years, thus eliminating any possibility, uh, any possible or unwelcome competition, and was holidaying alone. X noticed that despite the plumpness of her upper arms, her wrists were almost slender. Her elbows, instead of ending in a point like lemons, as they normally do, were so cushioned with flesh that they disappeared into the intimacy of a cavity covered with little crevices and wrinkles. Whether or not she managed to understand X, who was by now digressing into a lengthy recital of cities, women, and wars, the woman unexpectedly introduced new subjects making comments which enchanted X. I have sent my dog to a school, he thought he heard her say, to learn English, because he only understands Swedish. He's making good progress and now responds correctly to commands like sit down. X found this intriguing. He then asked her whether the dog might stand up if one gave him the same command in Spanish. She did not understand the question. Um... There are lots of references to to history and, and literature. Um, just uh, taking advantage of the interest in the aroused ex goes, to, goes on to recommend other equally pornographic works by J.D. Salinger, Foucault, Cotazar. Uh, whether these overt activities are put to a stop, he carries in his pocket by the way of a secret line of attack a list of carefully selected books which you can slip into the hands of the passenger, enjoying a quick sidelines glance at page 51 of his Tristram Shandy. Once traveling on the long stretch between the city cemetery and the arbor with Nabokov's Ada, Risset Ardor, open in front of him, X noticed that the elderly lady by his side was engrossed in his book. As he turned the pages slowly, suspecting that her eyesight was none too good, she whispered into his ear, as if confiding a secret to a friend. When I was young, I too was an anarchist. To which X cryptically replied, Pleasure is desire. Um, there is lots of obvious political criticism as well. As well. Um, and the book goes on to, to analyze the sort of men, women, power dynamics and sexuality and it's uh feels like a smart feminist text 
that also briefly visits topics like pedophilia and love for the elderly. It's, I find this book, it's ex experimental, it's very literary, it's dreamlike prose that never stops interesting me. I felt this was a book that was a constant source of pleasure and that was hard to put down. So I very much recommend The Ship of Fools by Christina Perry Rossi. Until next time.